mic on is the mic all right hey look at that good morning everyone welcome to Hypatia stage really happy to start our second day of program and our first speaker today is Steve Amex from power technologies please welcome Steve thank you very much really pleased here to be at the O2 um, we're going to be talking about um, disruptive and innovative technology today um, the first uh, uh, slide I've got here, and it's really not a slide, I've tried to stay away from PowerPoint, I couldn't resist, I've got one slide today, uh, everything else is non-PowerPoint, um, but um, I thought I'd start with this, um, this is a little bit of recent news, um, for just from last month, uh, about power, so uh, if you haven't heard of power before, hopefully you'll start to see a lot about us, um, we've just received a, a, an amazing amount of funding, um, it's the largest piece of tech Series A funding uh, pretty much in history. Um, so we received a, a staggering $76 million uh, from a major US fund to scale our business worldwide. And one of the key reasons for that is that the technology that we use um, and that we're deploying um, satisfies a number of really key criteria. One of them is that it's globally scalable. Um, second, that it's in big demand uh, right now. Um, and I guess the third one is it has a number of the key elements within it uh, that are really, really important today. One is e-commerce and, and the other one is mobile. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, our solutions and some of the things that we're doing uh, in the disruptive space. Um, I'm going to try and make it a little bit interactive as well. Um, and also at the end, I'm going to try and slip in a few uh, stories from my travels. Um, so far this year, I've been to 28 different countries. All over, the, all over the world, Latin America, uh, Africa, and uh, if I look a little bit jaded um, with bags under my eyes today, it's because I came back from Bangladesh on Sunday, and it's, it took 19 hours to get back. Uh, so uh, I might be looking a little tired. Um, but one of the key things we've found is that the, the technologies that we're using um, uh, are enabling certain countries and certain markets to actually leapfrog technologies, and I'll talk a little bit about that. At the very end, I'm gonna mention uh, a few very, very interesting technological solutions that I've seen on my travels that aren't ours, but I thought you'd find them interesting. So uh, stick around to hear about the human bank branch and the milk ATM. So you can think about what the milk ATM might actually be. So lots of confused faces in the audience, but I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go forward. So what is power? Well, the first part of power is essentially an e-commerce platform. And this is the first part of disruptive technology. So we actually provide a platform that enables people to build online shops incredibly quickly. Um, if you had a bit more time today and a bit of fun, I could actually build you an online shop in about six or seven minutes. It's really that fast. Uh, for small businesses and for big businesses, that means one key thing, which is agility. Um, so we work with both big clients and also small clients. And one of the most exciting elements that we're doing at the moment is internationalization. So it enables people to launch online shops into different countries. And with that technology, make sure that those shops are very, very optimized. So I'll give you an idea by going to our um, Japanese version of our own site. Uh, so this is the Power website in Japan. And you'll see that everything is completely in Japanese. Um, and in fact, if you look up at the URL, the URL even includes Japanese into the URL itself. So this is a Japanese site in Japanese, running on servers in Japan, feeding the Japanese Google. So when Google looks at the site, it really f feels like uh, it is a local site in terms of, of Japanese. Um, why is that important? Because for an online shop, you want to be ranked really high near the top when people search for something. So we're enabling people to go and launch multiple different uh, websites into multiple different countries. So uh, one of our keynote customers um, is Electrolux. So if we look at the, the Electrolux uh, website here, just pulling that up, please bear with the iPad here. It's running on 3G because we don't have wireless in the O2. Um, one day I think they'll, they'll move forward and add the technology in, but we'll, we'll see. So we're just pulling up the Electrolux website now. And what we've done with Electrolux this year is we've enabled uh, uh, um, them to launch multiple websites in multiple countries. So rather than have a single website trying to cater for the whole of Europe, we've been able to launch, I'll try that again, we've been able to launch into uh, lots of different countries uh, for them. There we go. Isn't technology wonderful? This ran perfectly earlier. Now 3G decided that it doesn't want to show the website. 
Um, essentially, what the technology does is it enables us to launch a site into each country. So for Electrolux, we've done more than 40 e-commerce sites this year. Um, and to give you an idea, a really exciting uh, project was Switzerland. So in Switzerland, they speak three different languages. So uh, French, uh, German, and Italian. And Electrolux have three different brands. They have AEG, Zanussi, and Electrolux. And we were able to launch three different brand sites in three different languages in one week. So we actually launched nine enterprise-grade e-commerce sites with over 900,000 uh, spare parts on them uh, in a single week. Uh, that is quite amazing. Um, one of the things that, that that's done for their sales is their sales have absolutely rocketed this year because it means that they're at the top of uh, the Google searches in every one of the countries that we launch. Um, OK, let's leave Electrolux alone and, and talk a little bit about um, uh, Robbie Williams. So hopefully Robbie Williams' website will come up. There we go. Isn't that great? Ten minute talk with a blank screen. OK, um, so for, for Robbie, who has also played the O2, so I have something in common with Robbie Williams, um, apart from the obvious you know, voice and physique. Um, so Robbie has done a, a tour. And what we've done with, for Robbie is we've actually been launching websites into the countries where he's been touring. And that's been really, really interesting, because prior to that, you could only buy Robbie's merchandise in English. Now you've been able to buy it in Italian on an Italian website, and also German and um, also French as well. So when he did a, a concert in Paris, for example, he was able to buy, a, their fans were able to go online and buy from the, uh, uh, the website uh, in, uh, in French and Italian. OK, so it looks like we're having some fun with the web. We might come back to some of that um, in a little while. If that's, the, uh, um, if that's the speed of 3G, guys, we're going to have a real problem with video. So I was going to show you a video, um, but that's not going to happen either. So um, let me talk about the um, mobile, te uh, mobile technology. Look at that. Wow. That's scary. I wonder if that means we can have Robbie Williams. There we go. Look, there's Robbie. So this is Robbie's website. So one of the key things with Agile technology is it enables you to, to create simple sites and that are highly converting and that create high sales and switch them to different languages. You can see there is a uh, 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 country locator on there. The critical thing here is that these websites are completely different um, uh, websites for each of the countries that they're launching into. Um, so we're able to help the sales uh, to those specific uh, customers. We also do uh, Robbie's uh, clothing range, uh, which is Farrell. Um, let's see if we can go back to the Electrolux site now. Now that 3G seems to be working. Maybe, maybe not. OK. So let's move on to mobile technology. So th the reason the, the, the e-commerce technology is very disruptive is because it's all shared from a single cloud base uh, for e-commerce. So all of our customers share the same cloud. So if you imagine there's only one Facebook, there's only one eBay, there's only one Amazon. We've done that, but for lots and lots of our clients. We have over 300 major corporate clients that use multiple web shops, all running off the same infrastructure around the world. A lot of our customers um, uh, asked us, is there anything we can do to help with face-to-face uh, -face payments? So um, some of you may be familiar with Square and a few of these other guys who've used mobile technology to enable people to take payments. Uh, and what we've done is we've uh, created uh, the, a similar technology, uh, but for chip and pin. And rather than us go and sell it into the market, to enable us to sell it worldwide, we've actually provided it as a technology for other people to use. So we actually have about 25, 26 countries around the world that we will be implementing this, but for our clients. So we're, we're sharing this technology uh, with banks and with telcos uh, in particular. Now, I'm going to hold my breath and hope that we can actually see this video play. I think I'm probably being a little bit optimistic. While that's teeing itself up, um, what I'm going to do in just a moment is I'm going to switch to uh, showing you how the uh, mobile technology has been disruptive in a, in a particular in the particular market of mobile payments. In fact, we might just let that buffer in the background and switch over to. I'm going to go a bit old school now <laughs> because the technology is not hel helping me out in terms of 3G. So I'll, I'll use a whiteboard. So hopefully a whiteboard and pen will, will be able to go there. So. 
one of the reasons why um, face to face payments, it's very, very important to get that card based is cash is quite a, a, an expensive thing to process around the world. And it's also not a very safe thing to be doing. So a lot of the countries I've been traveling to uh, in Asia and in Africa, you don't really want to be transporting cash around a lot. So moving that to card payments is quite important. This industry for payments is an interesting one because it's what we would classify as an oligopoly. So there are two or three very, very large players that are selling machinery into that. So um, when you go to your uh, local restaurant uh, or your local bar, you'll be familiar with what I like to call the big fat bricks. Okay, so the waiter or the waitress will come to you with a big fat brick and ask you to put your, your credit card into that. So if you imagine uh, the traditional way of supporting the industry was with big fat bricks. So you'd get this massive great big fat brick with a printer on it. As you can see, I went to art school. Um, and here we go, you'll have a big screen on there and you'll have a bunch of keys and you'll stick your card into that and that's your big fat brick, okay? Now a few years ago, the cost of a big fat brick was about $1,000, okay? So if you think about that impact for the market, that means only the biggest type of merchants can afford to have the technology. So that's a few years ago, it's a it was $1,000. So if we move on two or three years down the line, normally technological evolution, if you think about things like mobile phones, you would have moved on a lot, right? So let's see what that big fat brick looks like three years later. It's an oligopoly. They're not moving the technology very fast. Because why? Why would you? If you're selling and you're dominating the market with two or three big players, there's not, uh, not a lot of competition. So what we looked at that, uh, uh, looked at that market and said, okay, hold on a second. If we could be revolutionary rather than evolutionary and we could get to the end point really quickly with the technology, could we make a difference to that? So what we decided to do was to go from that to that. So what we've developed is the world's smallest chip and pin machine, which is basically that big. Okay, so I always, every, it's, it's lovely. When I show this, people's eyes just open up. So there's a couple of key reasons why this technology is really, really important. It leverages the mobile phone or the smartphone from the application perspective. So the actual the intelligence and the application that's driving the mobile payments is actually handled in the phone. So iOS or Android driving that. And you can see that the, the, the pin pad itself is about half the size of an iPhone. Uh, so in terms of the technology, it's very important. What it's done is brought the price of the technology down significantly, so it becomes disruptive. So what that's enabled us to do is it's enabled us to help a number of different segments that previously couldn't use chip and pin technology. Now, I don't know how much you know about payments, but the most secure way of taking a credit card payment is with chip and pin. And the reason for that is that the pin is only known to you and it's in your head. So when you swipe a transaction, Anybody could have that information, and it's very easy for fraud to happen. Chip and pin, it's very, very difficult. So Visa, MasterCard, and the guys around the world are really trying to push chip and pin technology into a lot of countries. Um, I'm working on a project at the moment in Africa with delivery drivers, and sadly, they lose two or three of their delivery drivers uh, 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 to uh, attacks and robberies every year. So it goes beyond uh, uh, economics. Sometimes it comes into the, into the realm of really, really helping merchants and helping big companies uh, make a real big difference from that perspective. So if we think about um, that um, disruptive technology, so where did I put my pen? There we go. If you look at the market for trading merchants, you've essentially got five tiers of merchants. So in the top tier here, you would have, for example, in the UK, say John Lewis, okay? So John Lewis are in the top there. They're using the big fat bricks. That's fine because they've got a lot of volume of uh, transactions going through. And as you move down here, the point of sale or the big, big fat brick market is satisfying the big guys and some of the medium sized guys, some of the smaller guys, and probably halfway down here. But this mar uh, 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 set of merchants down the bottom are not being served by the technology. So these are the micro merchants and the smaller merchants. If you think about the last time an electrician or a plumber came to your house, they weren't able to take credit card unless they had a big fat brick. But that's very, very expensive uh, for that small business to have, uh, uh, have on there. So uh, what we've done is if we've brought this small, uh, small little disruptive unit in, and on the, on the, what's this? this is called mobile point of sale, and that mobile point of sale can be used down here. 
but it also can be used in the top area as well. So what a lot of big um, uh, merchants are doing is enabling them to change the user experience inside their stores. So our CEO often talks about, uh, tells a little story about Marks and Spencers. So Marks and Spencers, when he goes onto their website, so we come from e-commerce, so that's our heartland. When he goes onto their website, says, hi Dan, welcome back. And Dan always buys black underpants, black socks. That's all he buys from M&S and white t-shirts. Right, so they welcome him back saying, hi Dan, how are you? Here's all your order history. We've got an offer on black socks this week. Buy three, get, you know, get an extra two pairs. They know you quite intimately on a one-to-one -one basis in terms of e-commerce. If you think about your last experience on Amazon, Amazon were telling you a whole bunch of stuff about you that is pretty intricate. They know what you buy, they know what your preferences are. Let's take Marks and Spencers on Tottenham Court Road. You can walk into Marks and Spencers Tottenham Court Road for the 100th time. They don't know who you are. They've got no idea. Because if you look at the till systems and the way everything is laid out today, it's over 100 years old. You walk in the door, you pick up a basket. You walk along to a shelf, you pick something up off the shelf. You put it into the basket and you walk up to a till. Now, yes, there's been a little bit of movement, so you don't necessarily hand it to an individual. Um, you actually may be doing a self-service till, so it's speeding it up a little bit. But the future we see is uh, very much one of tablets and pin pads, which enable um, the same experience that you have online to be had in the store. So for example, when you come in, you could be uh, GPS located on your, on your phone, letting the store know that you're walking in the door, and then they know it's me. Hi, Steve. Welcome. We've got a special offer in aisle nine. Yeah, go to aisle nine and we'll give you a special offer, but it's just for you. Yeah, it's not for everybody that's walking in because we really know uh, that you really like Jal Frazee curry and it's buy one, get one free, but just for Steve. So the future of that is really, really interesting and that's gonna be very disruptive in the, in the, in the, in the coming uh, months and the coming years. Also things like um, uh, with tablets, you can do things like queue busting. Yeah, you can just go up to somebody in the queue and say, hey, look, I, understand, I can see you've got three or four things in your, in your basket. Let me scan them. One, two, three, on the tablet, pin pad, take the payment, done. Pop-up shops, the ability to open a shop up wherever you are. I mean, here, for example, um, I found it yesterday very, very hard to, to get a bottle of water or a can of Coke because you know, the nearest vending stand's a long way away. Why? Because they've got to put all of the technology for that vending stand in to certain locations. It's not that mobile, it's actually fixed. In the future with uh, 3G enabled uh, technology and with pin pads, you literally could have a guy there from Costa Coffee selling all of my massive audience of 500 people, hello everybody, uh, the Costa Coffee, yeah? It's just under 500 in the audience. Um, so mobile technology will change a lot of things. You'll also have uh, the ability to change shopping hours as well. So our third technology, which I'm not allowed to show you today because it's not public yet, enables you to instantly purchase products um, wherever you are. So wherever you are on a train, uh, at home, uh, it's standing in front of a shop window when the shop is shut, it allows allow you to buy wherever you are. Um, and that's coming out in a few months time. So that's our disruptive uh, 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 technologies there. Um, one of the interesting things with this, this technology is uh, if we start to talk about um, the things I've been doing uh, around the world, in South Africa, we're looking at some, some fantastic applications for this, this mobile technology. So if you imagine a, a tablet uh, uh, with a pin pad, you can basically configure the application to do whatever you want it to do, and then the pin pad to take the, the payment. So for example, we're looking at a doctor's app. So this will replace all of the insurance paperwork for a doctor to enable them to streamline their practice. But if the customer has run out of insurance to be able to pay for their consultation or, or, uh, at the doctors, they'll be able to pay with chip and pin. Now, why is that important in South Africa? Well, it's, it's not the safest country in the world to be storing um, cash at the doctor's surgery. You know, you've already got drugs. If you add cash and drugs into the same position in South Africa, that's not great. Uh, so they really want to be taking sort of chip and pin transactions. We're also looking at things like policeman's app. I know that's not great, you know, helping the police out, but um, in, in that sense for fines. So instead of the policeman taking fines um, in cash, they'll be able to take it uh, via chip and pin. Um, taxi drivers as well, you know, be able to take card. Again, in some countries they've even mandated that you have to have card payments for taxi drivers for the driver's safety so that they're not carrying cash. So there's lots of fantastic applications for the, for the mobile technology. Okay. 
What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you um, a few of the stories uh, from around uh, the world. Um, and just reiterate that, that although disruptive technology um, uh, can really make changes uh, in Western and society in, in Europe and USA, when you start going into developing countries, things change quite considerably. Uh, so, for example, I was presenting to a bank uh, in Kenya, one of the very, very big banks in Kenya. And there I was, you know, typical Western businessman, suited and booted with my laptop and my PowerPoint, you know, presenting away to the bank in their boardroom. And in the middle of the presentation, all the lights went out. So I'm sitting there in pitch darkness. And I'm thinking to myself, OK, that's never happened to me before. Right? I'm in a bank, and all the lights have gone out. Um, but 10, 15 seconds later, the lights came back on. The backup generator kicked in, uh, and the lights came back on. And what was interesting was everybody around the table was looking at me like I was a fool. Why don't you just carry on? Because for them, that's a regular occurrence. You know, electricity outages are a real issue uh, in Africa. So in terms of technology, it's important for us to remember that when you introduce a disruptive technology, try and think out of the box in terms of how that could be applied. Uh, for example, uh, talking to another uh, uh, customer of ours in Africa, they were telling me they've got 2,000 shops that they would like to distribute this technology out through 2,000 shops to their merchants. And the, the chap was telling me that the first place they would put it is into their own shops. And I said, well, surely you have the big fat brick sitting there to take the payments. He said, yeah. He said, but on average, our shops lose electricity at least twice a week for up to an hour at a time. So the big fat brick's no good because it's drawing power from the wall. But we love your pin pad because it's got battery in it. So when the electricity's out, we can still take money off of people. So disruptive technology, you know, and you don't even think about this. It's been a real op opener for me this year because you don't even think about things like electricity outages and stuff like that. So I'd encourage you all to think about uh, how you can use exciting disruptive technologies, but in emerging markets, the way you use them could be very, very different. I wanted to kind of finish the talk with um, uh, two uh, little um, stories that um, uh, really sort of uh, impacted me uh, in traveling around Africa um, and how these disruptive technologies can really make a difference to people. And they both um, re um, refer to rural Africa um, getting out into the villages and out into the regions. And the first one is a, is a program called the Human Bank Branch. So this is a really innovative program. They're looking to have 8,000 people um, uh, involved with this and essentially they can't afford to put a bank branch close enough to the villages so what they're doing is they're training up um, one of their agents who in effect will actually be a human branch so you think about all of the different activities that a branch would do it's that guy yeah so he'll go and sit in the village hall at the table and say right I'm open yeah for business he is the ATM he will take money in and he will give money out He'll sort out loans, he'll sort out merchant accounts. He'll do every function that he possibly can do with an Android tablet on 3G so that he's communicating with the branch and processing all of the paperwork. And I, I thought that was, a, that was a fantastic example of how the new technologies, particularly mobile, are enabling emerging markets um, and developing countries to literally leapfrog over um, uh, the Western uh, markets. Um, our big customer, First National Bank in South Africa, um, amazed everybody last year by being the biggest supplier of iPads in South Africa. Over 100,000 uh, iPads. And it's part of their digital program to enable people to interact with the bank without having to go into a branch. Because going into a branch is a really challenging thing. It takes a long time to go into a branch um, in South Africa, for example. You have to go in, you have to go through security. Um, you have to, it's like airport security, basically. They take all your metals off of you and things like that as well. Um, so if you can service your customers from an iPad, I think that's great. So that's a human branch project, and you should be able to find some of the stuff about that online. Um, but the, the final one I wanted to share with you um, is the Milk ATM project. Okay, so every, every person I've spoken to about this just looks at me and says, Re really, a Milk ATM? What does a Milk ATM do? Well, ATMs are evolving very, very quickly into becoming um, something where you can go to the ATM and do a lot of things like pay bills, put money in, take money out, that kind of thing. And uh, they came across a really interesting problem in India where the dairy farmers were having real problem getting paid in the rural areas. So, um, and this is a real issue because they produce the milk, 
the milk would go to the distributor, the distributor would test the milk, make sure the milk is the right consistency, grade it, and then give them their money. But by the time the money got back to the, the dairy farmer, many of them would have been gone out of business or gone hungry or whatever. So it's a real, real challenge. So some bright sparks said, well, hold on a second. We've got two, two technologies here. We've got an ATM that can give out money, and we have a machine that you can pour the milk into that will measure the milk, how much it is, the quality, the consistency, etc. So we've got these two technologies. Why don't we just stick them together? So it's actually genuine. You can read all about it here um, on um, uh, Business World India. So hopefully that will pull up in, in just a second. But it's genuinely the, the milk ATM. So what they've done is they've created an ATM technology with a big hopper behind it uh, for the milk. And the farmer literally comes along, pours the milk into the hopper, it measures it, and then it dispenses the cash uh, to, to the um, uh, to the farmer. So there's some, some fantastic programs uh, out there around the world and uh, when the 3G catches up with that, uh, it's interesting. I think one of the things in terms of the future, uh, really well illustrated here by my blank screen, let's see if we can put something back, is, yeah, let's put that back there. Um, one of the things that's really important is uh, there's a really important role for governments to play uh, in terms of some of the underlying technologies that really help uh, these sort of technologies come into the market. And I think 4G is, is, is critically important. So, for example, I went to um, Saudi Arabia um, earlier this year, and uh, I was talking about this mobile technology, and I said, you know, we've got this fantastic pin pad, and, and it works on 3G, because although this has got a lot of images, and it takes a little while to come up, this has a very tiny data packet. So in terms of this working, it can actually even work on an edge connection. So it can work on like a... a, a uh, less than 3G. As long as it's got a little data signal, it can actually work. So I explained to the guy and I said, hey, you know, it works on uh, uh, 3G and it works on edge, but, you know, uh, he was laughing. And I said, sorry, uh, you know, what's funny? And he said, we have 4G everywhere. So in Saudi, in the two major cities, it's 4G absolutely everywhere. So it's like lightning fast. But what that means is it means all the other technologies that are related to mobile can can accelerate forward. So I think uh, those kind of uh, uh, technology underpinning um, are really, really important. Okay, so um, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So we'd like to open it up to the floor. We've got a microphone, which I'm told works, so we're good. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of interesting information there. Thank you. Does anybody have questions that you would like to ask Steve? Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I was at a talk yesterday, and they were saying that young people are withholding more and more information because of you know, the idea that actually we're sharing too much. And you mentioned Marks and Spencers getting in uh, 3G location, they'll be able to see who we are. But that's only on the onus that we share who we are. Yeah, I think there's some context to be put into this. So I, I used Marks and Spencers as an example purely because, uh, you know, it's not somebody that we particularly work with, but, you know, I shop there all the time on Tottenham Court Road, so it's a good, good anecdote. Um, I think the, the, the case of personal data is a really important one. Um, people share a huge amount of their personal information via social networks today. Uh, on a much, much wider scale than they would do on, uh, for example, a shopping application. So um, there is a big um, duty of care that retailers need to be playing with when they're talking about personal data. Uh, fortunately, we're very well regulated uh, in the UK and in Europe uh, and the USA around the use of personal data in that kind of way. And it very much has to be an opt-in piece. Um, uh, one of the interesting things I found with uh, when Bluetooth, I don't know if you remember when Bluetooth... Uh, offers were first switched on, okay? Um, so for the young people in the audience, yeah, uh, this was some time ago. Um, I remember switching it on for the first time uh, going through Euston Station, and I switched it off within 45 seconds because it turned Bluetooth on, and it meant that every retailer was spamming you with their, their offers in terms of Bluetooth. So that died instantly because it wasn't a, um, an opt-in technology uh, in terms of marketing. So I think marketing is very, very important that it's opt-in. So if you look at uh, the technologies that have really struggled now, um, uh, email, you know, when was the last time we responded to a non-solicited email? 
yeah. Apart from the one from the Nigerian royal family who need your help to bring some money into the country. Um, you know, so there's lots of spam that's, uh, that's coming in from email, and I really, uh, uh, that's a very, very good point. It's really important that the people that use this technology that gives you the information about people use it very, very carefully and very wisely to help aid and speed up the shopping experience, and that's the key. It's, you know, that example of me walking into to m and and them saying, well, there's, there's a special offer on Jal Frazee. Now, if they gave me an offer on, you know, um, frog's legs, which I don't particularly like, um, then that would not be, that would be wasting my time. If we get this information, you'll hear a lot of people talk about big data. It's this one of the, the phrases that's rolling around at the moment, big data. Capturing the data from um, your consumers um, and using that data to, to help you sell and inform. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, young people are restricting the amount of information, although I'm still flabbergasted how much people share on on, on social media. I think that's more of an issue than it is for in terms of retail at the moment. Hi, Steve. Hello. Hello. Stranger at Stranger. the back who I don't know at all. <laughs> I was just wondering, with the mobile point of sale device that Empower has, do you think it could rejuvenate the high street? Because obviously in the last five years or so, we've seen a massive decline in the way that the high street has been able to sort of keep up with online, um, convergence of commerce, all that kind of stuff. So how do you think this device and the way it's distributed could help re reinvigorate the, the high street across the globe, I guess? I, I think what it gives, it gives the, the, the high street retailer a whole bunch of new options and a whole bunch of new ways of interacting with their customers. So let's take a practical example. It's Valentine's Day, okay? Um, and I'm in my office in, uh, uh, in, in town and I, I realise it's Valentine's Day, right, I'm going to go, go and get some flowers for my wife, um, uh, go and get some red roses. So I walk out to the florist and the queue at the florist is out the door because it's Valentine's Day and it's the small little florist there, yeah, um, who's really busy that day but not that busy in, uh, on other days. Um, because they're fixed to their, that location, They've, they're stuck in there with a big fat brick and you know, they're waiting for their queue to go down. With the mobile point of sale, on Valentine's Day, they could be proactively visiting the local offices where all they need is the, you know, the mobile phone uh, and the pin pad and you could go around and say, hey, you know, we've got a special offer on roses today because it's Valentine's Day. It can take a payment, you know, payment at the desk and all that kind of stuff. So y you see people, um, the sandwich man that goes around and sells the sandwiches into the offices, that's a mobile business, but that's a very small percentage of the businesses today that are that agile and that mobile. One of the ways that you're able to do, um, uh, uh, to bring, go out into the streets and into your local neighborhoods, it's very, very powerful for the small businesses in, in rural areas where the high streets are dying and struggling because they're stuck. So one of the biggest things I hear from small businesses in, uh, in small high streets in the UK is they don't have parking. So, you know, people can't get there, so they go drive to an out-of-town uh, large supermarket and they lose that business. With the mobile point of sale, that makes it a lot easier for them to step out of their retail premises. But it also means that they can start having the conversation with the customer in a tracked kind of way because a, a big fat brick that you put your credit card details into doesn't actually capture any data. This captures what the customer's bought, their email address or their, their, their mobile phone number for the receipt and that kind of thing, which allows them to communicate. So the example I often give is you, you take a, 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 a payment from somebody at an event or a pop-up shop or when you're delivering, the receipt might have an offer to come into the store on a day when you're quiet. So I think it's really important that um, uh, we look at this technology as a way of enabling the high street to change the user experience to a better one. That example I gave earlier about queue busting, um, having informed uh, 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 till systems using iPads and, and Android tablets and that sort of thing, but also enabling them to reach out into the local community and to be able to, to go and have transactions in a whole bunch of different places. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Sorry, just, just one, one more there. Um, threat of other sort of com competitors coming in. So you go to Apple, an Apple store, and you have an Apple app, and I can pay whatever I want through my phone. I don't even need to talk to anybody. Okay, so it's a, a store-specific app on, on my phone. So Marks and Spencer may have a store-specific app 
which means that you won't really need the chip and pin bit because you have all of your details registered. Is that, you know, is that factored in? Well, there's a couple of elements there. Firstly, if you don't use chip and pin, you have a significant liability shift for the retailer. So if they use an application that doesn't use a pin, then the liability shifts to the retailer. So if it's a fraudulent transaction, even if it's stored data, if it's a fraudulent transaction, the liability shifts onto the merchant rather than back onto the bank. So using chip and pin, it shifts the liability back down the chain towards the banks and to the, to, to the card scheme. So that's very important. Um, I have a lot of people that talk about a lot of these uh, very interesting uh, technologies for instant payment, but the liability shift, if it's a merchant to a merchant, Peer-to-peer -peer is different, so you know, if I want to send you money because we're going out to a restaurant tonight and I haven't got any cash on me and I want to ping you some money with something like Barclays Ping It, person to person, that's different. If it's a merchant taking money off of somebody, the most secure technology so far has been chip and pin. It's a chip that reads the data and a pin that's in my head. Yeah? That's not stored anywhere. So e-commerce gets a little bit there with uh, uh, the additional 3D secure, the additional step where you have to put another uh, uh, transaction in. So that's one element to it. I think the other element to it is that um, w we're not going directly into the market trying to sell to merchants. We're providing this technology to other people that would go do that. So um, our customers are banks, telcos, etc. It's a very busy market. There's a lot of people there, but you've got to uh, think about this maybe, that um, mobile payments um, and invoice payments are 45, I think it's 45 or 50 trillion dollars. So the available size of the market is absolutely huge. I mean, we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, people in our pipeline in lots of different countries around the world, banks and telcos that are looking for this kind of technology. So uh, to be honest, if there are other people in the market with good quality uh, solutions, well-funded, you know, great customer service, yeah, bring it on. I'd rather see 10 really good suppliers in the market um, um, bringing the whole market forward. So, you know, competition is healthy and competition is good. Obviously, you know, our technology is the best. So, but there you go. Yeah. Next, any questions? We've got about another 10 minutes, guys. Any more questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I saw a keypad from PayPal yes, yesterday. So PayPal have its own kind of keypad, so you can pay for stuff yep. similar to, to chip and pin. Did you physically see it? No, it was online. Okay, because okay. I'd love to physically see it, because yeah. it, it's been coming all year. So uh, right. we, we, we can't wait to get our hands on it. Um, it's a very similar technology. So you're talking about the, 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 the pin pad from PayPal. Yep. Um, uh, it's about the size just a bit bigger than a phone, so it's about twice the size of uh, what we're doing. Um, obviously, PayPal entering the market is fantastic news. Um, it will educate the consumer to smaller chip and pin devices, so we see it as a very, very positive move. Got a great relationship with PayPal. Uh, we, we process literally hundreds of millions of dollars of PayPal payments through our e-commerce platform. It's a fantastic service uh, uh, that they provide for, uh, for merchants uh, and for consumers as well. And it's great news that they're coming into the market uh, with a chip and pin device. Um, I'm not sure when it will physically arrive, uh, in the market, but it, it will be great news for everybody, I think, because it will push the agenda in terms of um, devices that use a smartphone. Uh, it, it uses the same technology as we do to communicate with a smartphone, which is Bluetooth. So the, the reason these technologies are so secure is because inside each of these pin pads is uh, a unique encryption key. So half of the encryption key sits on this pin pad, the other one sits on the servers at the bank. So it's point-to-point -point or end-to-end -end encryption. So when you put your data in, your pin, pin in here, it's not stored. So these don't store. They use real-time 3G or wireless to transmit that packet. Um, and although Bluetooth between that and the phone is not the, the absolutely bulletproof in terms of uh, security, it doesn't really matter because the, the information packet, by the time it gets to the phone, is completely encrypted anyway. Uh, so uh, PayPal uses the same technology as I understand. I think what I like about your idea is that you are empowering uh, retailers and giving them the platform because too often um, you have you know a company like PayPal saying you know use our product what you're saying is listen we have the platform which you can use and you can customize it so you're giving them sort of authority over everything 
Yeah, I think that, um, to quote our CEO in, a, in an article from last year, he said we're the, we're the Android, not the Apple. Yeah, so we're providing yeah. a, a platform that yeah. is really developer friendly. Uh, at the front end, we use um, SDKs, application libraries, and APIs, uh, which are all terms that, uh, as it's a technical audience, I can chuck those out. Um, so we use all of those kind of good things to essentially a toolkit for people to implement and build on it themselves rather than trying to uh, shoehorn in our own brand. So you won't see, you know, you won't see our brand out there um, uh, on, on the technology. It will be white labeled in uh, for our customers. You need to travel. Sorry? You need to travel. Uh, I need to travel. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yeah. Look at that. It's great. Well, it'll be an easier travel, actually, this time. Uh, Bangladesh was 19 hours to get back from on, on Sunday. So uh, uh, going back from here to Tottenham Court Road, I think it'll be a bit of a breeze. Uh, uh, we've got time maybe for one more? Yeah. One more question, two more questions. The numbers have swelled significantly. Oh, guys, behind the cameras, I wish you could see this. It's like a, a <laughs> sea of people. They're all very shy, though. Come on, one more. Come on. <laughs> I think there's a lot of information. Maybe we all come up with questions later. Yeah, if anybody's got any questions later, feel free to get in contact with us. Uh, uh, it's a very exciting time for power. Um, you know, huge funding, huge growth. Uh, we're very proud that uh, David Cameron also took time out uh, from uh, Downing Street to, to make an announcement about our funding, uh, which is very unusual. So uh, there's a, a big quote from them. Uh, he said he was very proud of us to be creating 250 jobs uh, in this current market and that e-commerce is, is core uh, for, for the UK in terms of small business uh, growth. So um, it's a great time to be at Power and uh, thank you very much for your time today and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you all for being here. Our next talk starts at 11 o'clock, which will be on big data. Thank you. <laughs>